This is Michael Woodward, and this is Season 2, Episode 47 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast, a podcast focused on telling the stories of dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers. Along the way, we'll give you some tips and ideas of how you can chase your own big ideas and dreams and change the world around you. Our guest on today's episode is CJ Windish. More about CJ in a moment. I am super excited to announce Monday's guest. His name is Phil Rosenthal. You might know him as the creator of Everybody Loves Raymond and now the star of Somebody Feed Phil on Netflix. It is a super fun episode. We talk about a lot of great stuff. You're not going to want to miss it. So check out Monday's episode with our guest, Phil Rosenthal. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have an incredible episode ahead for you today. Before we get going, I want to encourage you, wherever you listen to podcasts, go ahead and go over there right now. Click that subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode of the Jumble Think Podcast. If you like listening on iTunes or on Spotify, we've made it easy for you to subscribe. All you have to do is go on over to jumblethink.com slash iTunes or jumblethink.com slash Spotify. That's jumblethink.com slash iTunes or jumblethink.com slash Spotify. And it will take you right to where you can subscribe to our podcast. Now let's dive into the conversation with today's guest, CJ Windish. My guest today is CJ Windish. CJ, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. I'm excited to be here. Can you tell us your business name and your role at the business and what the business does? Yeah, I'm uh, CJ Windish, the CEO and founder of Robotica. And what we do is we make robotic arms. So if you've ever seen like the big robotic arms that are in factories, like in the Tesla factory, yeah. or something like that, uh, we're making those, but at a much smaller scale. Okay, that's very cool. Yeah. Now, how did this journey start for you of getting into robotics and knowing that you wanted to start a company building these great uh, robotic arms for individuals and for other corporations and things like that? I think it really started when I was in college. So uh, I went to college. I went to USC. Uh, I went there. I wanted to do film. Um, I didn't get into the film school. I got into the engineering school because I was kind of good at math and science. Okay. Um, so I, I spent the first year trying to get into the film school, and I quickly realized that film and television just wasn't for me. I, I wasn't good at it. There were much better people at, at it. Uh, I wasn't good at, like, the whole networking thing you need to do in film. Um, so I, I was kind of at this point the year after uh, my freshman year, the summer after my freshman year, of just kind of, like, deciding what, what do I want to do with my life. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm here. I, um, do I want to stick with engineering? Do I want to try to pursue film? What do I want to do? And I really thought about it. You know, I had I learned a bunch my first year in college. I had learned about like great scientists, great entrepreneurs and business people and politicians and people that have, have really changed the world. And I kind of realized like what I'm good at is technology. And my kind of mission became, I want to make technology that makes people's lives more efficient so they can spend time on things that they want to, like friends and family. Um, so that became my mission. And I think after the internet, the internet was the huge thing at the end of the, the 20th century. And after right. the internet, right. the next big thing is going to be robotics. And that's what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of this automation revolution where one day everything is going to be automated, where you don't have to worry about like, folding laundry anymore. You don't have to worry about cooking. We spend so much of our time doing those things. It's unbelievable. Um, and I just think it's going to be done by machine one day and machines one day. And I want to be the person that helps make that happen. So it sounds like what you're doing really has some significance for making the lives of individuals and families much better. So how does this matter and how does this impact us every day? I think robotics is going to be huge. It, 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 it's just like the internet changed all our lives, just like mobile phones changed all our lives. Um, it's going to be one of those things that we take for granted in 10 or 20 years. Um, 
just like food preparation, for example, I think that's gonna be automated. So one day you'll have a robotic arm, maybe two of them sitting in your kitchen and it will be there to prepare food for you. It'll chop the food, it'll put it in a frying pan, it'll cook it on the stove and it will put it on a plate for you. And I think that just having something like that automated would save millions of people, everyone on the planet, so much time. Um, so I think robotics and like automation of our, our daily chores is just, is just gonna be huge. So, okay, we've talked a little yeah. bit about the big picture, but uh, can you tell us maybe some stories of how you're seeing at, at the micro level some of the things you're building and some of the things you're doing starting to individual uh, impact individuals? Maybe, uh, maybe one story of, of fulfillment or significance uh, and purpose and how that fulfills you. With robotics, I haven't got there yet. So we're, we're, we're still in the, okay. the prototyping phase, so we haven't re released a product yet. Um, but I can talk about how, how software I've worked on has impacted people. So uh, I worked, used to work at a company called Box and uh, we built software for businesses. And we used to see these, these uh, businesses have these old paper processes where it would take weeks to send mail stuff back and forth. Um, and just to get like contracts done for buildings and stuff, they had to send architectural drawings back and forth or they had to send contracts back and forth and they do it like through mail. Um, yeah. Once they started using the cloud, once they started doing everything online, uh, using some of the software that I helped build, um, it cut a process from like weeks down to just like uh, minutes where they could just send it back wow. and forth, do it securely and have it approved. Um, so it, it, I, I've seen software have uh, the Internet especially save people hours and hours of time and businesses, too. Uh, so I think that's a, a concrete story. I'm not there with your robotics yet, but maybe in a few years I'll have a, a concrete story with robotics. So you're in this early prototyping stage. Yep. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of really cool things happening with, uh, you know, this very early season of, of what you're doing. What's one challenge you're currently working to overcome as you grow this business, build this business and, uh, Build what you're doing. I, I think the biggest challenge for me, uh, my background is in software. So, um, I told you in college I wanted to do I wanted to do robotics, but there wasn't really a path forward to study robotics. There wasn't like a robotics major or anything like that. So I kind of stuck with yeah. software engineering, um, and life kind of happened. So I didn't get into robotics right away. I went into software engineering, and I I did that for many years. Um, and then a few years ago, I finally. Put my foot down and drew a line in the sand and it said i've always wanted to do robotics now i'm gonna i kind of have a little bit of freedom so now i'm gonna do what it takes to learn how to do this so the biggest challenge has been uh switching from software to this new field of building machines has been quite a challenge um i've had to learn like a whole new field of uh engineering which is mechanical engineering and there's, there's just so much to it and it's so different from what i'm used to um and there's not really a clear path for robotics. It's such a new field that you can't really like go take a robotics major at a college. Some of them have them, but most of them focus on the software and I'm trying to build the, mach the actual machines themselves. And there wasn't really a good path for it. So I've kind of learned it by piecing together classes, piecing together books, reading stuff online, and just kind of aggregating all these data sources. Um, and it's taken, taken a couple years to kind of learn everything that I needed to learn to build one of these things. That's been the biggest challenge. What's the next big goal you have for the business and where you want to go with the business? The next big goal is uh, just getting the prototype working. So uh, I, I've got like a very early version working and it, it, it works okay, but it, it's got some kinks that need to be worked out. And uh, over the next year, uh, that's what I'll be doing. So uh, the next big milestone is uh, getting a six degree of freedom robot uh, functional um, and have it lifting 10 pounds. So my, my goal is to get it to lift 10 pounds. So the problem with like robotic arms that are out there, um, there's a lot of toy ones but that don't lift very much weight. They only lift a couple pounds. Uh, so the big yeah. challenge is to make them lift like a real amount of weight. So like 10 pounds is a, a decent amount where they can do something useful. Um, there are industrial ones that do that, but they cost like $50,000. Uh, so th that's not really viable for a lot of applications. So I'm trying to build a robotic arm that's high payload and uh, low cost and uh, getting it functional is the next big challenge. 
uh, and then after that, getting the cost down. In a moment, we'll be right back with CJ Windish and diving more into this topic of robotics. So you finally decided it's time to take the leap, to go from the known to the unknown, to chase the big idea and dream, and to make it a reality. But you don't know what to do next. The JumbleThink team is here to help you. We've worked with hundreds of businesses, entrepreneurs, and people with amazing ideas to take them from that idea and make it into reality. Doing it on your own is hard, and you don't have to do that. So let's start the conversation. Head on over to jumblethink.com slash help me. That's jumblethink.com slash help me. And let's start the conversation of moving your dream from a dream, your idea from an idea, and start making it a reality to change the world around you. Now let's go deeper into our conversation with today's guest, CJ Windish. We are back with CJ Windish and talking all about robotics and innovation and ideas. It's going to be a lot of fun. CJ, before we dive in, I want to make sure people know how they can find you as they're listening. Maybe they're commuting and they want to pull it up on their phone or carpooling and they want to pull it up because they're they're with a group of people not driving. Uh, <laughs> even if it's autonomous, don't be uh, taking those eyes <laughs> off the street. So how can people find you and connect with you? Uh, I'm CJ underscore Windish on social media. Uh, Twitter is a good place to find me. All right, so you are jumping into the world of robotics. You've worked in the, the software side of things. Yeah. Uh, and and you, you were talking a little bit in the first segment about the challenges of uh, going beyond software and starting to learn the mechanical engineering side. Tell us a little bit about the journey of learning something that there isn't a, a massive roadmap out there. Robotics is something that's uh, evolving quickly. It's changing. It's growing. Uh, you've shared some of the struggles you've had uh, in, in that journey. How are you learning something that there isn't a roadmap to follow maybe in the footsteps of others? Yeah, it, it's been really tough. I kind of, when I first got started, I kind of tried to figure out how other people have done it. And usually what they've done is they've come from a background of either mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or software. And then they kind of mm. just learned the rest through either home projects or just uh, doing it, or some people went to grad school, but even grad school uh, mostly teaches you about the software. Um, so it, it's a lot of like side projects and stuff like that. So my first step was um, I, I tried to learn it on my own at first. I, I, I went to the library and I was like, okay, this is what I need to understand um, how this robotic arm works and kind of the, the governing equations of how this thing works. And I was like, I don't quite understand the chapter that I'm reading. Let me figure it out. And I did yeah. some research, and I realized that um, to get to where I needed to get in understanding, it was the 21st chapter of a second book in a two-part series. So it, it was just like thousands of pages of like really dense physics that I had to learn. And I was like, okay, I don't, I, I don't think I can do this on my own. Uh, so I, I found a college. There's... Um, this great program at Cal State Long Beach called Open University. And they have this thing where you can take classes at the college and you don't have to be admitted. Um, so I was able to just kind of pick and choose classes that I wanted to learn and kind of set my own curriculum. I, I based it on their mechanical engineering curriculum um, and just started taking classes there. And, and, and that was the, the first step. Uh, and then while I was doing that, I was doing some side projects to kind of get better at electronics. Um, and um, also doing a lot of reading, uh, a lot of time in the engineering library at USC. So, so you are able to connect with a community of people uh, and get some of the fundamentals, whether it's electrical, whether it's some of these engineering principles, and, and, and begin to learn them through a traditional method. As you're approaching the problems, and I know some of those problems that uh, you're specifically trying to call, uh, uh, solve is, one, making it affordable, yep. and uh, then also making it easy to use uh, for the end user. Yeah. So these principles that you're learning, 
uh, often have the challenges of making that much simple, simpler, affordable, uh, and accessible to people. How are you approaching solving those problems by taking the applied knowledge that you're learning and uh, making it a much more tangible product for the end consumer? I think uh, starting out, um, the, the first people who buy the robot, we were talking about making it easy to use, will probably be programmers. So I, I recently got started on this journey. I said I've always wanted to do robotics. Uh, but when I decided to actually do it a few years ago, I was going to buy a robotic arm. I was going to say, what is, I wanted to see what the limit to this technology was. I want to see, could I make a robot, like cook me dinner or something like that? I just wanted to see if I could do it. So I, I went online and I did some research and I found on Kickstarter, there was kind of uh, a couple arms out there that were between like $300 and $1,500. But the problem was they could only lift like a pound or two. So they wouldn't okay. do uh, what I wanted. They, it wouldn't be enough to like lift a frying pan. So the next step up was that uh, from that was the industrial robotic arms. So I called up a distributor and I said, how much is it going to take to uh, get my hands on one of these things? They said, well, it costs $25,000 for the arm. And then uh, it's probably another 10 or 20K in accessories. So you're looking at probably $45,000, $50,000. Uh, so wow. obviously I wasn't going to do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and from then on, I just decided, okay, there's got to be a way to make these things cheaper. There's got to be a way to make them um, be able to lift um, a high payload, like 10 pounds, uh, which isn't an incredibly high payload. Uh, it's just bigger than one or two pounds. Um, and do it for cheap. And uh, as I did research, uh, I found that um, these, they're not, robotic arms are not quite as complex as you would think. Um, they're okay. like some motors and some gears and some power transmission um, that's controlled by uh, uh, precision precision servo motors. Um, so what I found was the expensive parts are the motors and kind of the gearing uh, that go into these things. So my, my first prototypes, I kind of bought motors and gears, but uh, buying stuff that's powerful enough is quite expensive. They're, they're like hundreds yeah. of dollars for uh, uh, these motors for so for of the initial prototypes i bought it and said okay i'm going to start with these expensive things and then i'll figure out how to reduce the cost later uh, i think i'm going to end up having to make my own motors or um have to buy cheap motors and somehow get high performance out of them um so it, it, it's definitely been a journey figuring out uh what are all the pieces that go into these things and then how to reduce the cost one of the things that's really fun is as I was doing research on the interview today, I jumped on your YouTube channel, yeah. uh, Tinker and Build. Super cool, super fun. Uh, and there's all kinds of different little projects people can see and learn from you. Uh, you've done some projects with Raspberry Pi, little microcomputers, and that's super fun. Uh, and then you're also, uh, you've built little... Uh, Kilm's not the right word, <laughs> but uh, uh, you've built... Uh, places where you can do molding and casting of metal. In this process, you're you're taking and you're finding parts. You're you're seeing what you can use to fit within your goals, and then you're you're taking what you've learned from those products and innovating new things that fit your requirements. Uh, and and so trial and error is a part of your process. Uh, I love the the one video where you're uh, you cut out little shapes of T and you're trying different uh, T as in the letter uh, and you're trying different sands for casting. Yeah. How important is that trial and error and that process of iteration as you're trying to innovate in this space? Yeah, casting is really hard. If you watch the videos, it's a little embarrassing <laughs> how the cast turns out. But uh, um, trial and error, it, it's like. I've really gotten into this maker movement. Um, right. I'm a little uh, late to the game. It's been around for many years, uh, but I've really gotten into like making things um, recently. And Tinker and Build is kind of one way to record uh, the projects that I'm doing. Um, and it's always, it's always, I love it because like every project, I don't know how to do it, start going into it. Um, but finding like online research courses, finding documentation, kind of piecing blogs together and stuff like that. Um, eventually, I figure out what I want to figure out uh, and, and get it working. It, it, it's interesting uh, the difference between 
uh, software and electronics is software, if I'm trying to figure something out, almost all the problems have been solved. You can go on Stack Overflow and there, there's somebody who yeah. answered the question that I have. Um, with electronics, there's some of that, but it's a, a little bit more sparse and it's a little bit more spread out and it's harder to find. Uh, and with mechanical stuff, it's almost non-existent. <laughs> um, oh, wow. So it, it, it's really difficult to find uh, guidance online, like trying to figure out how to do metal casting. There were some YouTube videos that kind of showed the basics of it, but I took one of those classes at, at Cal State Long Beach and they they told me kind of the, the, the professional way of doing it. And, it, the way professionals do it is a little bit different than the way YouTube videos do it. We did some of the <laughs> basics, but uh, like the different casting sands, there there's so many different options, and uh, I had no idea which is the right one to use. Uh, so you just bought a bunch of them and, and tried them out and uh, decided to see which method worked best. So yeah, uh, I, I think trial and error is important to anybody who's trying to make something or anybody who's uh, doing makery type stuff. Uh, you just got to try stuff and see what works. I, I'm sure there's moments where uh, you are doing this trial and error and you're learning and you're iterating and you just feel like you're hitting a wall or you're discouraged by a failure on a specific experiment that you're doing. What are some tools that you use to help reduce that issue of, of, okay, I've failed. I've hit this wall. How do you get back up? How do you keep going? How do you overcome probably those emotions sometimes of, of, okay, that maybe this isn't worth it. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from a background of software. So I'm so used to like running into walls and uh, running into <laughs> bugs that I just can't fix, or I can't figure out the problem. Um, I just keep at it. And for me, what works is like, I think software and making and doing electronics and stuff like I do on the YouTube channel, um, they're very similar in that you can't really get interesting stuff done in like an hour time. So what I tend to do is I say, okay, I'm blocking out this eight hour window or these two eight hour windows over the weekend. And I'm going to figure out how to make this new chip work, or I'm going to figure out uh, how to get Wi-Fi to work on this chip, or I'm going to figure out how to hook up the circuit. Um, the difference between software and electronics is that with software, if you screw something up, you can always just go back and fix it. With electronics, yeah. if you screw something up, you can blow out the chip, which I've done many times. And then I have to call Amazon and say, hey, send me another one. And then there's a couple week delay. That's actually the hardest part with uh, electronics. It's like you, you want to keep working on it, but you just broke something. So you have to wait for another one to come. I, I've kind of I've wised up now that I try to I, I buy two or three parts at a time. So. Uh, <laughs> that way I can screw up a couple times and keep going. But yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is just taking a block of time, like a big block of time, not saying like, I'm going to work on this for an hour, but saying I'm going to work on this all afternoon, uh, from noon until 8 PM or something like that. And a big block of time, just so I can keep hammering away at it. And when I have that kind of mindset of I'm going to be here all day, uh, I don't get tempted to like, okay, this isn't working. I need to walk away. I, I just kind of power through it. That's very cool. That's very, very cool. You're in the process of innovating and you're building these products that seem very Jetson-esque or, you know, that's the process of what you're, you're building uh, eventually. That's the goal. How does this integrate into our lives? Because I think there's some fears right now about AI. There's fears about uh, robotics and how it impacts us at a social level, how it impacts us at a jobs level, and and how we adapt to this new normal where technology is playing more and more of a part of automation. Yeah, I mean, I'm from Michigan, so it was uh, it, I've, I've seen the the car economy get largely automated, and uh, uh, a lot of people went through hard times when that happened. Stuff either got uh, shipped overseas or uh, jobs just got automated. Um, and it was difficult for people, but I think what ended up happening is everybody adapts. Um, I think a lot of people went back to school. Um, like one of my family members uh, used to be a, a computer operator, um, so he would operate mainframes. Um, obviously, the PC revolution came along and kind of ended mainframes, uh, so he, he was without a job. And what he did was he went back to school, retrained, and now he's working in the medical field. And I think that's what a lot of people are going to do when jobs um, 
get replaced by robotics. So um, the big thing that everybody's worried about, the, the biggest hit uh, won't actually come from robotic arms. It'll come from self-driving cars. So once trucking is automated, there's going to be a lot of people that lose jobs. Um, but I think people will adapt. I think, I think they'll, they'll retrain, and I, I think they'll be okay. There will be a kind of a short-term hardship for some people. Uh, I think almost everybody goes through that at least once in their life. Uh, but I think they'll retrain and probably do a more interesting job afterwards. As we think of this as a society, what is the social responsibility if you're creating robotic uh, mechanisms or or using AI? What is the responsibility for um, how this interface? Uh, you know, we all see the movies where the robots take over. Uh, when you're a developer and a designer building these things and thinking of the future and how this becomes more and more a part of our lives, what are the kind of safety mechanisms and social responsibility uh, pieces that you guys are thinking of to make sure that those kind of things don't happen? The the doomsday kind of movie robot takes over the world kind of scenarios happen. Yeah, when I was in college, I before I decided to do, you know, that I thought robotics was the first thing, I really thought, you know, what artificial intelligence is probably the biggest thing that I can work on. Uh, and I did a bunch of research yeah. and I went to the library, got all the books on artificial intelligence and started reading it. And I was really unimpressed by what artificial intelligence <laughs> meant. Uh, if, you, if you know how like neural networks work or something like that or the way uh, computer vision works. It, it, it's it's not near general intelligence. It's like we're we're nowhere we're nowhere close to that. Uh, so I don't tend to worry too much about AI taking over the world, <laughs> just because we're we're nowhere close to that. With robotics, I I think the biggest thing uh, like I think the big thing that will happen with like what I'm working on with a uh, low cost robotic arm, I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of artificial intelligence behind it. There will be like some computer vision that it uses. Um, but I think a lot of what skill, what is gonna get automated is like very repetitive tasks. So like chopping vegetables or something like that, or uh, making espresso or something like that. Very uh, repetitive tasks that you do over and over and over again. Um, there's there's some AI behind that, but it's very far from like the general intelligence that you you see in like the Jetsons or something like that. Um, yeah. So uh, there's not a lot of like uh, realistically there there's not like people putting in safeguards for robots taking over because <laughs> they're we're nowhere close to that. Um, yeah, I I think the next uh, the next generation of robots will. Uh, basically be told exactly what to do, which is the way they work in factories right now. Move to this point, pick up this part, move it to another place, put it down. And, and I think that's kind of uh, what I'm working on. I think Boston Dynamics is a little bit more interesting where they have kind of these autonomous things that um, can do all sorts of mobility that's truly amazing. Uh, that's way more advanced than any, anything I'm working on. Uh, but even then, the, the autonomy that they have is they're they're kind of pathfinding. They're they're not really thinking for themselves. They they can just kind of find their way through a path of least resistance. So th there's not a whole lot of safeguards against like AI taking over. There's no like robotic laws or stuff like that because we wouldn't even know how to program that into a computer because we we're not we're so far away from that happening. It, it, it's really not something that I worry about. Okay, so we've talked about the the industry as a whole. Yeah. I want to go a little bit broader and talk about entrepreneurship because so much of our culture right now is moving towards um, self-employed or our freelancer economies. And you talked about the maker movement that's exploded and people are using CNC machines and uh, 3D printers and all kinds of different tools to help be a catalyst for uh, innovation. So for you, as you're diving into this space and as you're creating and as you're growing uh, the, the foundation of, of a business, how do others need to really start shifting their mind because uh, uh, of the potential of what's out there with the new technologies that are available? I, I think it's a great time where I think more than any point in history, there's this opportunity for people to be entrepreneurs. I, I think it's great that uh, the internet is one of the things that has just opened up 
so many possibilities, so many people. Uh, as a software engineer, I, I'm approached by people every time I go to an event uh, with an idea for an app or an idea for a website. And I think that's amazing that so many people have these ideas and if they work hard on it, they can uh, actually build these things. And I think it's one of those times where anybody can do this. The tough part is it's very, <laughs> I found out the hard way, it's, it's pretty difficult to be an entrepreneur, <laughs> but once you do it, it there, there's no turning back. I think it's so much freedom that knowing that you can survive without knowing exactly where the next paycheck is going to come from. It's the freedom of saying, right. I can go out there and make a sale or I can sign a contract. I can go out there and use marketing skills and sales skills to, to pick up revenue versus like having to go get a job. It's, it's very freeing. And I think that if people want to take that leap, they absolutely should be prepared for a rough, a rough ride starting out. But well, once you get the hang of it, once you get used to like uh, producing revenue just through like putting it, putting yourself out there versus like having to go to a job, um, it's an amazing feeling. It's very freeing. That's very cool. So you started out in the world of software. You have gone back and learned a lot about mechanical engineering and the hardware aspect of it. I, I think so often... Uh, people approach problems and they're like, I have an idea for uh, a great startup, but they don't know the software part. Or like you, maybe they have this great invention that they want to build and they don't understand the hardware part. What can some of those people do when they have these great ideas and maybe they don't have the experience of software or hardware uh, development, or maybe they know part of it, but they're not quite sure how to do the other piece. What are the things that you've learned on your journey that they could apply to their journey of, of becoming these creators that they long to be? I, I think I used to have a hard time empathizing or kind of understanding where non-technical founders were coming from. But now with this robotics thing, I'm pretty much a non-technical founder in the sense that I didn't know anything about it uh, when I was starting. I knew very little about robotics when I was starting. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what people who want to get into building mobile apps or uh, building internet companies face. I still think the best way is to just learn a little bit of code yourself. I really think that people who really want to be internet entrepreneurs, they need to at least like build something out of code, just like the very basics, like take a class in it, uh, maybe do a boot camp if, you, if you've got the money to spare and the time to spare. Um, but just like just getting by enough to build a prototype, one, it frees you up so much uh, time trying to recruit somebody. Two, it's like software engineers are very expensive. Um, so if you can do it yourself, you'll save a lot of money. Um, three, just the process of learning it. Like if you're really going to lead, if you're really going to be the CEO of a company that leads uh, software engineers or, or, or leads a technology team, it really helps to be able to uh, empathize uh, with what they're going through and kind of understand what the work they actually do is. So um, I really think spending time to learn at least a little bit how to code, don't try to become an expert, but learning enough to like build a prototype or get something working is really worth the time and effort. And it's going to take you longer. Um, a lot of people will say, no, just find a co-founder or just hire somebody. You can do that. But I, I really think spending the time to learn how to code, do the basics will be time well spent. And plus you, it, it gives you a kind of a, a skill set uh, that's marketable afterwards. If, uh, your internet idea doesn't work out. I think that's great insight. As a person who's been a web developer for for several years now, almost 10 years now, even just if you're going to be in that place of doing a startup uh, and it requires software or hardware, having the understanding of the philosophies behind the code makes it so much yeah. easier to find the right developers, the right software engineers, and be able to speak in such a way that, that you're conveying the idea clearly to them and they can really make that vision come alive. Yeah, exactly. Like, If you've never written code before, you really don't understand how the internet works and it's just like a black box to you. It's really hard to write a spec uh, to, to, spe to put out the requirements of whatever your idea should do. Um, so many people have 
uh, like half baked ideas. They uh, they, they know they, they kind of know what it should do, but they don't think about okay, how should the login system work? How should, should sharing work? Um, how should user management work? Should there be an admin console? Uh, should there be companies? Uh, how are we going to deal with payments? They don't really think through all these things. And uh, sitting down, sitting down with an expert will help you spec out those things. Um, but coming to the expert, you should actually have. If you want to make your oh sound legit, you should actually have a pretty good idea of what all those details are. You don't have to know them all, um, but I think learning to code really helps you get there, of where you kind of understand all the aspects of a system. Um, maybe not all of the aspects, but uh, a, a, enough to the point where you can start to spec things uh, reliably. You're building this company called Robotica, and you're yep. making thing ex things accessible to people that might not be uh, realistic because of the price points and the ease of using. Uh, as you're on this journey, um, you're playing for the long game. You're you're not looking for the instantaneous. I've have all of these solutions. Uh, I have the the, the, the arm that's perfect and it's easy to use. You, you don't have all those pieces together and, and you're working towards that. How do you stay motivated through knowing where you want to be but not being there yet and processing that idea and developing it into a finalized product? I, I tell you, it's tough because... <laughs> It's take, it takes a really long time. It's very different than software where uh, I, I'm used to like, uh, I've done a couple of software companies and it's like when I'm ready to launch a, a product, I, I kind of take a week or two to spec it out um, and then just bang away at a keyboard for a month or two, then it's ready to go and you get the first version out and then you kind of iterate from there. Uh, when you're doing like a physical product or uh, especially as difficult as uh, robotics, it's every it's just everything takes a long time. The development cycle is so much longer, um, and, and sometimes it is hard to stay motivated because uh, uh, people doubt you and they don't think you can do it. But some people um, people ask me why do you want to do hardware? It's like software is so much easier, and that's your expertise. Why don't you just stick with that? Um, it is tough to stay motivated, but I, I think what helps me is every inch of the way. Like the first time. The first time I got like a machine that actually moved was a huge accomplishment. It's like that had been a, that been on my my goal list for like multiple years. So um, just like little wins like that, where it's like, oh, something moved. Uh, oh, every, all the parts fit together for the first time. These little wins that go along those help me stay motivated. Um, so it, as long as I set myself up to kind of hit these like miniature milestones. And I don't make them too big where it takes like six months to hit one. As long as I can do it every couple of weeks or something like that, uh, th that tends to help. Before we wrap up this segment, I want to make sure that uh, we mention again how people can connect and find you. So what's the best way for people to connect? Uh, Twitter is the best way. It's at CJ underscore Windish on Twitter. Very cool. In a moment, we'll be right back with CJ Windish in our rapid fire questions. The passion of JumbleThink is to see idea makers, dreamers, entrepreneurs make those dreams and ideas a reality. One of the ways we do that are through the free guides you can download through jumblethink.com slash guide. So head on over to jumblethink.com slash guide and you can download any of our free guides. Currently we have two, how to know when you found your dream and overcoming the unknown. So swing on over to jumblethink.com slash guide and download your free guides and start the journey of chasing big ideas and dreams and becoming the entrepreneur you've always wanted to be. Now let's return to our rapid fire questions with CJ Windish. We're back with CJ Windish and our rapid fire questions. CJ, you ready to dive into rapid fire questions? Let's do it. Cool. The first question is, what is one tip you would give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know how to start? I think you just have to dive in. You 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 do a lot of research. Uh, do as much research as you can uh, to figure out how to make the idea happen. Talk to uh, talk to as many people as you can. Uh, but you really just got to dive in and just start doing it. Um, 
and don't get in the analysis paralysis. I, I see people get in this phase a lot where uh, they just want to analyze their idea. They want to write this huge business plan and all this stuff. I mean, think about those things, but don't don't spend a long time thinking about it because it's all going to change. So you, you just kind of got to dive in and do whatever it takes to make it happen. Speaking of change, what is one change you'd like to see in the world? I would love to have a robot that cooks me dinner. <laughs> <laughs> love Seriously, it. though, That's like awesome. uh, automating, uh, automating uh, the the kind of mundane tasks in my daily life. I would love to see that happen. I'd love to live in a day where uh, my grandkids don't have to do kind of boring chores anymore just because machines do them. That's kind of the biggest change that I'd like to see in the world. What do you want your legacy to be? Definitely, I want to be known as a major entrepreneur in robotics. Um, I I see how like science and like research is important. Um, it's so not tangible enough for me. Uh, I I kind of understand like why it's important to do all this research and stuff like that. But I, that's just not what my legacy is going to be. My legacy is going to be I'm one of the people that kind of took the ideas of science and technology and kind of made it real. So I wasn't the first person that um, thought of a computer. I want to be more like uh, the Bill Gates or the Steve Jobs who took those kind of things that were in university and brought them into the real world. And not only brought them into the real world, but kind of delivered them to a mass amount of people. So kind yeah. of take things, technology out of the lab and bring it to a large number of people. And that's what I want to do with robotics. Where do you find inspiration? I love watching stuff on Boston Dynamics. That's very inspiring. Uh, reading, uh, I, I've got, I read my news app. And one of the things that I have favorited is stuff about Elon Musk. So I read stuff about Tesla okay. and SpaceX all the time. And that's, that, that's very inspirational. What is one book that you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read and why? I love the book Tribal Leadership. It was okay. a bestseller many years ago, uh, but it kind of talks about how uh, there's kind of like phases people go through um, and how, how to kind of like motivate groups of people and kind of uh, groups, group dynamics and organizations and not just organizations, but communities. And I think it's an extremely insightful book about uh, how to be a leader and just how to recognize uh, what an organization's kind of status is or the, the, the state that they're in. Um, are, are they set up to like achieve or is it not a very well run organization or is it political? And I think tribal leadership kind of is very enlightening on not only how to identify what state an organization is or a community or a group of people, uh, but also how to change it and kind of evolve it into uh, a high functioning org. Perfect. Uh, I think that's really, really good. I've not heard of that book, so I'm excited to check it out too. Not a lot of people so. have, so it, it, yeah. it, it, it's it, it was a bestseller, but uh, it's a very interesting book. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm looking forward to checking it out. What is one tool that is significant for the success of your business? Probably servo motors are the most important tool that I have <laughs> <laughs> to make the robot work. <laughs> And uh, what is one habit that you find helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? I think the biggest habit that I've picked up in the past couple of years is I kind of start my day by uh, going to a coffee shop and kind of setting out my to-do list for the day. Um, I do it for okay. the week too, but I, I kind of set it out for the day, do everything I need to do, and then kind of at the end of the day, sit down and kind of recoup, okay, I got this done, got this done, move the stuff to the next day and being very organized about what I want to get done for this week and even hour by hour has been very helpful in getting a lot done because when, when you're working on a startup, you're always low on resources. You're always low on time and being super, super organized with your time is very helpful in getting stuff done. Well, you mentioned how you start your day going to the coffee shop, setting out your goals for the day. How do you finish your day? Usually the same thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sometimes I go to the coffee shop or uh, sometimes I, uh, I just sit at home on the couch. Uh, I break out my notebook and say, okay, what did I get done? What do I need to move to the next day? Or what do I need to move to later in the week? Uh, so it's always kind of centered around my notebook and kind of my, I have one sheet of paper that I keep myself. So I have to put everything on one sheet that I get done on the week uh, that I want to get done for the week. If it takes longer than a sheet, that means it's too much stuff. If it 
it's not enough to fill up the sheet. That means I can probably put more stuff in there. And if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, if I wasn't doing robotics, I, I think the other thing that I would love to do is to probably go back to school and do like a PhD and do some, some research. Um, I thought about going that way. I, I kind of my, a project that I love to do on the side is I'd love to do theoretical computer science. So, <laughs> uh, doing like original mathematics, I find to be very fun and entertaining and it takes a really long time and it's really challenging and really hard. Uh, I, I think I could see myself going back to get a PhD, uh, to do some research in, uh, theoretical computer science. Um, but I think I want to do robotics first. What is one dream you are still wanting to fulfill in your own life? I think my, my biggest dream that I would love to fulfill is to be a successful entrepreneur. So I've been kind of working on companies the past like seven years or so, and none, none of them has really taken off. So I've worked at companies. I, I've been an employee at a company that's uh, taken off and has done great things, but I've never really founded one myself. So I would really love to have uh, a big, successful uh, company. That, that's, that's one dream that I want to fulfill. So being that founder... Uh, and being a founder of a, a company that takes off, not just an employee that you're, you're a piece of that. Exactly. Yeah. Very, very cool. As we wrap up today's episode, I want to leave you with the final thought. So what would you like to share with us as your final thought? I think my final thought would be, don't be scared of robotics. Don't be scared of AI. Uh, change, it'll change society. Robotics will definitely change society, but it will make it a much better place. Once so much of process of building things, making things, making food, our daily tasks, once that once that's automated, all our lives will be so much better. And I don't think people have anything to fear in AI or robotics. I think it's just going to make the world better. CJ, it's been a lot of fun having you on the podcast. Thanks for taking time out, sharing uh, your stories of what's going on and what you're building, along with some insights into the world of robotics. It's been a lot of fun. I enjoyed it too. Thanks for having me on. Once again, we want to thank today's guest, CJ Windish, for taking time out, sharing some insights into the world of robotics, and giving us some tips of how we can chase our own big ideas and dreams and change the world around us. If you want to connect more with CJ, make sure you check the episode notes for all of his links. Our guest on Monday's episode is Phil Rosenthal. Phil is the creator of Everybody Loves Raymond, and he recently created a new show called Somebody Feed Phil. You can find it on Netflix. It's now in season two, and it's going to be a really, really fun episode. So make sure to come back on Monday and check out our conversation with Phil Rosenthal. Before we wrap up today's episode, I want to encourage you, wherever you like to listen to your podcast, head on over, click the subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode of the Jumble Think podcast. If you listen on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, simply swing on over to jumblethink.com slash iTunes. That's jumblethink.com slash iTunes. It will take you right to the Jumblethink page on iTunes. You can click that subscribe button there. You can do the same thing with Spotify by going to jumblethink.com slash Spotify. That's jumblethink.com slash Spotify, and you can subscribe there too. And if you like listening on iHeart, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, all of the regular places. You can find us and you can click subscribe and never miss an episode of the Jumble Think Podcast. Here's my final thought as we wrap up today's episode. Steve Jobs once said, remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. I want to encourage you today. Think about the things that you're, you're putting off for one day the dream you have, the trip you want to take, the idea you want to create, whatever it is for you, think of that thing and start coming up with a plan to make it a reality. One day may never happen, so start today to make those big ideas and dreams a reality and change the world around you. Thanks again for tuning into today's episode. Now go out there, live big, chase big dreams, and change the world around you peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant